Hey guys, it's Chris at Highline Guitars. You're watching another one of my YouTube guitar building videos. If you're new to my channel, welcome. I hope that by the end of this video, I'll have earned your subscription. And to everyone who's watching, if you enjoy this video or get something out of it, I would appreciate it if you would click that thumbs up button. That tells YouTube to promote my videos to other folks with similar interests. It also tells YouTube what kind of videos you like to watch. And that means YouTube will serve up videos that are in your area of interest. And you may find yourself discovering videos and channels that you didn't even know exist. Also, if you would like to help support the channel financially, you can visit my eGuitar Plans web store. There's a link in the description below or you can visit my Highline Guitars merch store which is displayed below this description for this video and whatever you purchase is going to help support this channel plus you'll be getting something in return. What I'm going to be talking about in today's video is part seven of my electric violin build and what that means is I'm going to be making the body on my CNC machine. So let's jump in and get started. The body is going to be two pieces, a top half and a bottom half, and they're going to be cut from a single slab of mahogany. Normally I would use clamps to hold the workpiece down to the wasteboard, but in this instance I'm going to have to use screws and then screw it down to the wasteboard. And the reason for that is because the blank, or the workpiece, is barely large enough to encompass the two halves of the body. And in several areas, the bit is probably going to cut out the side. So to make sure that it's firmly secured, I'm going to use screws. Before I can screw the mahogany workpiece down to the wasteboard, I need to make sure that it's lined up properly. So I will align the center lines that I've drawn on the workpiece to the lines that are engraved on the wasteboard of my CNC machine. And then once I have the workpiece aligned with the center of the wasteboard, I can screw down those wood screws and get everything ready for the first carving operation. Before I can carve anything, I need to home the machine, and this is part of the process of setting up the XYZ start position for the carve. What homing does is it moves the spindle to the lower left corner of the machine's workspace, and limit switches are tripped, which stops the movement of the spindle and the uh, gantry, and that tells the controller exactly where the machine is located. It also allows me to change the bit, uh, to the whatever bit I'm going to be using for that first carving operation. In this case, it is a quarter inch diameter two flute spiral upcut bit. From the home position, I can jog the machine to the right 24 inches, which places it right at the center of the workspace. Then I'll jog it back 24 inches on the y-axis, which puts the center of the spindle directly over the very center of the workpiece. And that's where I like to probe the bit so that I can uh, tell the controller what the z-axis uh, start position will be. Now from this position, I can numerically jog the spindle forward and then over to the left, which will place the center of the tip of the bit in the XYZ start position for this carve. Then I can send the G-code for that first carving operation. For this first carving operation, I'm going to be cutting part of the uh, neck cavity as well as the cavities for the inside of each body half. Uh, this body is going to be hollow in an effort to keep it as light as possible. For this carving operation, I'm only going to do a rough pass. I'm not going to do a finishing pass because it's really not necessary. Once the body halves have been glued together, it's going to be difficult to see inside uh, of those cavities to see where the tool marks would be. Uh, there will be F holes, but they're just not large enough to really reveal anything. I know some folks are going to wonder why I'm not using a dust shoe here. I have a closet full of dust shoes and I don't use them when I'm making videos because 
it blocks your view of what that bit is doing when it's carving. So I end up having to do quite a bit of cleanup after the carve is done. All of the carving on this side of the workpiece is done so I can remove the screws that are holding the workpiece to the wasteboard. And then I'm going to be able to flip the wasteboard over. And then once I flip it over, of course, I have to realign the center lines on the workpiece with the lines that are engraved in the wasteboard so that I can ensure that all the carving that happens on this side is going to register perfectly with all the carving that I did on the other side. Since my start position is down in the lower left corner of the workpiece, one thing I had noticed is that because these screws sit proud of the surface, I had to countersink the hole so that I could screw that particular screw down below the surface. That way the bit isn't going to hit it as it moves from the start position to where it begins the carve. All of the carving operations on this side of the workpiece are going to be for the uh, outside of the body halves. And the first carving operation is going to involve cutting the F hole. So what I have to do is swap out that quarter inch bit for a sixteenth of an inch diameter two flute spiral upcut bit. And that's what I'm going to use to cut those F holes. Of course any time that you swap out a bit you have to reprobe it so that the controller knows the distance between the tip of the bit and the surface that is going to be carved into. After cutting those F holes, I had to swap out that uh, 16th inch diameter bit for a quarter inch diameter two flute spiral upcut bit so that I could cut the contour shapes in this violin. Now this violin is going to be similar to an acoustic violin in that the top and the bottom are, they have a contoured curved shape. So I'm going to do two carving passes. The first is going to be a rough cut pass which removes most of the wood and then the second pass is a finishing pass which smooths out that surface. The final operation for making this body is to cut the perimeter and that's going to include tabs that will hold each body half into the blank so that it doesn't go flying around once that bit has cut all the way through. Now you'll notice if you look closely I've added some extra screws to hold the blank down to the work surface and the reason for that is because as you will see here the bit is actually cutting out the side of the, the workpiece and so to keep everything secure I decided it would be a good idea to add a few extra screws just to play it safe. After cutting the perimeter shape, all the work for cutting this body was complete. So I was able to remove all the screws that I had used to secure the workpiece down to the wasteboard. And as you'll see here, the body halves are still secured in the blank using taps. So what I have to do now is take a little saw and cut those tabs so that I can liberate each half from the blank.
Before I can glue these two halves together, I need to clean up this area here because when I cut this with the CNC machine, the bit that I use, the quarter inch diameter bit, leaves a rounded corner that has a radius of an eighth of an inch. And that's not gonna work with the tenon that I have on this neck. The corners, as you can see, are sharp. So I'm gonna take a chisel and chisel out that rounded shape there so that the neck tenon will fit nicely down into this little slot here. Now I'm ready to glue these two halves together and I'll be using the Type Bond Original like I always use. And I will just apply just to this one side. I don't really need to do it on both sides because I don't want an excessive amount of glue. It's just a waste. And, and really Type Bond glues wood so well that you can get away with far less glue than you might imagine. So I will apply this. I'm going to try to stay away from this area right now because I don't want glue squeeze out inside this pocket area. So, and then I'm just going to spread it with my pinky. And this is a trick I learned from another luthier by the name of Robert Benedetto. He makes incredible arch top guitars, but he always spreads glue with his pinky. That way, when you pick stuff up, you don't get glue from your pinky deposited onto whatever it is you're picking up. So I will just spread it all the way evenly across the surface. And I've got plenty of clamps here, I hope. I've never glued a small violin body like this together, so I hope that my clamping method is gonna work. <laughs> There's a couple of ways I could do this. I could use clamps. I could also use the uh, inner tube from Bike Tire. You just simply wrap it around and pull it tight. And I have some inner tubes that I use specifically for that, but I think will probably be just fine as is. Now, before I put the top on and start clamping, I'm going to use some table salt to, and I'll sprinkle just a few grains in a few spots. And what that does is it keeps, it acts like a, a gripper and it will keep the two pieces from sliding against each other. Because as you know, wood glue can be pretty slippery. Okay, so now I will set the top on. I don't have any kind of indexing pens or anything like that. It's not really necessary. I can tell just by making sure that corners and contours are lining up that everything is going to be just fine so I don't have to really worry about that. And now I will begin applying my clamps. And I will 
just apply a little bit of pressure, not a whole lot, just enough to get the pieces clamped together. And then I will work my way around. And I, I like to rub my finger over the seam to make sure that it's lined up, which it is. And I'm using a combination of clamps. I'm using these ratchet clamps. And then I've also got a bunch of C-clamps here if I feel a need to add more clamping pressure. I'm going to let this sit now for probably three or four hours and let that glue thoroughly dry. Now I know there's a temptation to want to wipe off the squeeze out. Uh, however, when you do that, when you take a damp cloth and wipe off the excess squeeze out glue, what you end up doing is diluting that glue and then pressing the glue into the wood fibers which can inhibit the absorption of finish later on. So I just let the squeeze out dry and then I can come back with either a chisel or one of my Japanese Iwasaka files and just slice off that squeeze out. It hasn't absorbed into the surface of the wood that's on the outside of where it's being clamped. So uh, that's, that's how you can ensure that the wood glue that you're using to glue parts together isn't going to affect the absorption of finish, especially dyes and stains later on. All right, guys, well, that's all the time I have for this episode. Uh, the body is now finished, uh, as well as the neck and the fretboard. So what I'm gonna be doing in part eight is I'm going to start sanding the body, the neck and the fretboard and get it ready for finish. So be sure to check that out. And in the meantime, uh, click that subscribe button, the thumbs up button, visit eGuitarPlans.com, visit the Highline Guitars merch store, and, um, be sure to check out the other videos that I've made in on my channel. Uh, in fact, you can uh, watch the entire playlist for this particular build. And I have lots of other playlists for other guitars that I've built. So be sure to check those out. And in the meantime, take care, stay safe, and I hope you'll be back for part eight.